live. Yeah, it's live. good. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Patrick from the Poison Pen Bookstore, and I'm really happy to have two terrific crime writers with us today. Uh, uh, Stuart Neville is here. Again, we're going to be talking about uh, lots of things, music, um, books, um, short stories in particular. He's here with just just released terrific collection of short fiction, The Traveler and Other Stories. Um, and then, you know what, Luca, I should have asked you uh, the correct pronunciation before I began this uh, this thing. Is it Veste or Vesti? Either is fine. I don't mind either. As long as you don't say Vest, uh, that's, that's the one that really makes me just disappear. <laughs> what's, what's your preferred pronunciation? Vesti is perfect. All right, everybody. And our other author today is, uh, is Luca Vesti. I'm really, really glad to have you had a chance to join us for this. Um, and he's, we're going to be talking about his work, um, in particular, the just released book, The Silence, which uh, I understand in the UK it was called The Six, right? Mm -hmm. so there's That's a, right. So there's an interesting uh, kind of synergy between the two of you already because, you know, of course, Stuart's uh, first book, The Ghost of Belfast, uh, was called The Twelve in the UK. Uh, it's pretty interesting. But, um, Guys, welcome, Stuart Neville and Luca Thanks. Vesti. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you. It's, it's good to have you. Uh, have you both? And um, let me let me just start by giving you both uh, the the formal uh, introductions that you deserve. So let me let me try try my hand at it. Uh, Stuart Neville's debut novel, The Ghosts of Belfast, uh, published in the UK as The Twelve, uh, won the mystery thriller category of the Los Angeles Times Book Prize and was picked as one of the top crime novels of 2009 by both the New York Times and the LA Times. He has been shortlisted for various awards, including the MWA Edgar, CWA Dagger, uh, Theakston's Old Peculiar Novel of the Year, uh, the Barry, the McCavity, the Dillis, as well as the Irish Book Awards Crime Novel of the Year. He has since published nine more critically acclaimed books, two of which were under the pen name Halen Beck, uh, and we were just and Halen, we were just talking about how you know we're all kind of gutted by uh, the passing of uh, that icon of our you know particularly of our generation. It hurts so much, uh, Eddie Van Halen, and uh, of course the Halen in your in your pen name was for Eddie, and then Beck of course was for the great Jeff Beck, uh, yeah. who I actually saw in concert a few years ago, and the guy is just ageless. You know he sounded. Terrific, but I've, I've uh, interrupted your introduction. Um, Stewart's novels have been published into various languages, including German, Japanese, Korean, Polish, Swedish, Greek, and many more. Um, and uh, he's also a, a member, uh, along with our, our other guest, Luca, of uh, the Fine Loving Crime Writers, which um, I've been checking out some of your stuff online. You guys are really good. <laughs> And it looks like you're having a blast with, uh, with uh, is, is it kind of a rotating cast of authors that participate, or is it, we've got Val McDermott on vocals, Mark Billingham, Doug Johnstone, uh, and the two of you, and, uh, and Chris Brookmeyer. Is that kind of the permanent lineup? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a fairly solid lineup, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. And so, and then Luca Vesti is a writer of Italian and Liverpudlian heritage. Married with two young daughters and one of nine children. Uh, he studied psychology and criminology at university in Liverpool. He's the author of the Mur Murthy, Murphy and Rossi series, which includes Dead Gone, The Dying Place, Bloodstream, and Then She Was Gone. Um, part psychological thrillers, part police procedurals, his books follow the detective pairing of D.I. David Murphy and D.S. Laura Rossi. Uh, as I said, the novels are set in Liverpool, bringing the city to life in a dark and terrifying manner. Um, and that's the series that he's done so far, the four books with, uh, with those two characters. Uh, and then, you know, as I said, the new book is called The Silence, and we'll be talking about that. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to get that out of the way. And um, let's just start, and we'll just have kind of an informal conversation, of course. Um, but Stuart, let's talk a little bit about this collection of, of fiction. I, I mean, it's such a terrific kind of combination, um, you know, of, of crime fiction, you know, speculative fiction, a little bit of, of horror th elements thrown in there. Um, and also, uh, I, I really like the kind of the elements of mythology 
and sort of folklore that come into the books, into the stories as well. Can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, your love for the short story form? I like how in the introduction you talk about, you know, how much you love the form and what a kind of a refreshing uh, break it is from writing in the longer novel length. Um, it's, I, I always like to read short stories, you know, going back to when I was a kid and, um, uh, you know, I read a lot of Stephen King as a kid, so I, I loved, um, Night Shift was one of my, uh, first sort of collection that I read that I really loved. Um, you know, some of the stories in that book still stick with me now and, um, I used to buy those, uh, horror anthologies you would get with like, like worlds of dripping fangs kind of on the cover, you know, it was really kind of lurid. Uh, cheap paperback anthology anthologies you would get. I used to devour those. Um, so yeah, I've always been a reader of the short story, and and um, and over the years when I did sit down to try to write, it would be probably a balance of short stories and novels that I kind of tinkered with until I started taking them more seriously. And the first things I ever sold, the first things I ever published were short stories as well. Um, and indeed, my my like. And directly got my publishing day uh, through a short story when um, uh, Todd Robinson at thuglet.com bought uh, a story called The Last Dance, um, which was published, I think, in January of 2008, if my memory serves. And uh, I got an email a couple of weeks later from a man called Matt Sobel in New York, introduced himself as James Ellery's literary agent, and could I send him an all look at. And, um, that's yeah, so that's so actually, I, that's disgusting, Stuart. <laughs> that kind of break, man, that's the kind of call every writer would just dream about. <laughs> yeah. it, 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 was, it was quite a break, I mean, and it's, it's, um, but yeah, but the short story's always been there for me, it's always been a part of what I do. I've, I've never put that much of a separation between that and a novel in my head, and, and very often my novels have sprung from short stories, like uh, The Ghost of Belfast stars is a short story, right. as did The Lap Lines, as did... Um, so say the fallen was a short story as well, um, and I always always find it, most find it slightly old when I talk to other writers who don't like the form who find it difficult to work with in the form. I'll be interested to know what Luca has, has to say about it. It's not something we've ever actually discussed. I think um, whether Luca has much of a, a background in short stories at all. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, and the, the other thing short stories do is they offer a great deal of freedom, I think, as well. You're not kind of, with the investment of time and uh, publisher's money that goes into a novel, you, if you're a crime writer, you kind of, you have to kind of funnel things into that crime, through that crime lens, you know, to make some metaphor. Um, but uh, I find with short stories, there's that bit more freedom to step outside the, 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 the walls of the crime genre. Which takes me because there's always been that element of horror in my writing as well. So, as anybody who reads this collection will see, I think at least half the stories have some, uh, to some extent, some kind of supernatural element or, right. or at least unearthly element, you know? Right. And, um, you know, it's funny you mentioned uh, you know, the story that became, the short story that ultimately became uh, The Ghosts of Belfast. Uh, you know, I remember when that book came out. Was it? Has it been what eleven years now? Ten or eleven years? Uh, two thousand nine. It came out. Two thousand nine. Yeah, and just what a revelation it was, you know, and it just kind of a uh, almost an instant classic. Um, would you agree, Luca? <laughs> in the, uh, in the... I, I, I mean, I remember reading the well, it was the twelve in in the UK, obviously, and um, it was before I knew Stuart. Now Stuart and I are very close friends, but. I was a fan of his before I read the book, uh, before I met him actually after reading the book, um, and it was it's it's but you meet Stuart and it's and and I I, I struggled to marry the two and I think that might be the case with all writers though is like you kind of have to kind of divorce yourself from being a fan and being a friend it's very difficult because I was a fan of a me of of so many writers before becoming friends with them so many people in the band for example right. that were in fans of theirs before before you know we became friends um picking up on Stuart saying about short stories that's exactly how i started out as well as that i was i was i wrote short stories i wrote i, I first the thing first thing i wrote was a short story when i was 28 because i was a reader before that um and had no intention of writing because i didn't think that 
people from the social and economic background that I was from were allowed to write. I thought that was for some people who lived in Castle. You know, I thought that was like, you know, out of our remit. Um, but it wasn't until I was about 28 that I actually thought I was going to try it. And it was actually, um, it, it was a, it was kind of like I'd had a couple of beers too many one night and got into a drunken Facebook conversation with another writer um, who I was a fan of. And he kind of dared me to write this stupid idea. So I wrote a 600 word short story called Jeff the Uninspired Vampire. And that was just the most ridiculous thing. I forgot about it. I sent it to him. He messaged me back the next day and said, what, why have you done this? <laughs> but he also then went on to say, this is actually really good. You should, what else have you written? And I was like, nothing. And I will never write anything again. I am really sorry. Uh, that was a writer called Charlie Williams who wrote uh, excellent books, yeah. um, Dead Folk and, and, and things like that. But that kind of did start me on. I think before that, I was just reviewing books. Um, I was a blogger back in 2010, 2011. Um, but as soon as I started writing short stories, I, I kind of unlocked something within myself where it's like, actually, I've always been a storyteller. As you say in the introduction, I'm one of nine children. I come from a very large family. So in order to be heard, you have to have a good story to tell because you have to hold people's attention. And otherwise, you know, you're going to be kind of forgotten about, you know, they'll go on to the next bit. Right. <laughs> so many of um, so I started writing short stories and I actually put together, before my first novel was published, I put together a charity anthology of short stories called Off the Record. I where saw that. I, basically, yeah. I, I basically asked a whole bunch of writers to, to write stories um, for charity uh, based on song titles. And uh, I, I published that and uh, we raised a ton of money for charity. And then I started writing the first novel because I just thought that was what you were supposed to do next. And uh, it was at this point I was actually studying psychology and criminology at university. And um, that kind of took over my life after that. I kind of graduated and was already a writer at that point. I became a full-time writer the week after I graduated. Wow. And so then your first your first published novel, if I'm not mistaken, was Dead Gone. Is that right? I've got, yes. a, got a nice copy of it right here. Um, and, uh, and that introduced your two characters that you wrote, you know, the first grouping about. Um, and I'll ask you a little bit more about that. Um, but I wanted to say, you know, I love a good, um, a good epigraph. And uh, I got to say, this, uh, the epigraph for this book is wonderful. It's, it's uh, life is pleasant, death is peaceful. It's the transition that's troublesome by uh, Isaac Asimov. <laughs> I think that's a wonderful, wonderful uh, epigraph. Um, can you, you know, as before we go into the, the silence, you know, for, for readers and viewers who might be unfamiliar with you, um, can you tell us a little bit about, about the series that you've written so far? So the Murphy and Rossi series, it's, it's really strange to talk about because I haven't written about those characters for a number of years, but Dead Gone was the only book uh, with those characters in that came out in the US, uh, around for four books in the UK, um, and it was... It was, it was a police pairing that I put together that, that I kind of felt like I hadn't seen before and that I didn't know many books that were set in Liverpool, in England. Right. Um, you would see London detectives done brilliantly like by Mark Billingham and then you would have Scottish detectives that would be done brilliantly by Barney Bermody and Rankin and then all the way around the country. But I didn't really know anyone, that, any I couldn't find any that was set really in Liverpool. So I wanted to kind of also write about the Liverpool that I had grown up with is that it was an, a, a forever changing city to me, and I wanted to kind of reflect that in the books. Um, Liverpool had a kind of a sort of a viewpoint of other people in the, in the UK had about Liverpool was something that I didn't recognise having been lived there and been brought up there for 30 odd years. So I kind of wanted to, to portray that through the characters, and I had uh, David Murphy, who had, who had lived in the same place where I grew up, um, and Laura Rossi, who kind of mirrored my own uh, upbringing where she had Italian parents, which is what my background was. Um, so you had these kind of, you know, very differing viewpoints from these two characters and how they then investigated crime together. Um, and Dead Gone was very much brought from my experiences uh, studying in psychology. It's very much psychology based. It's, it's, it, it came to me in one of the very first lectures the idea of the book came to me from my, one of my very first lectures in psychology, which was about ethics in psychology. 
And what it was was an hour of them saying, this is what we used to, you know, this is what you're supposed to do. This is how you're supposed to do experiments. And, and you know, don't do anything that would hurt anyone or not, not just physically, but emotionally right. and all of these things. In the last five minutes was an endless stream of horror of things that they used to be able to do. And one of the experiments uh, was, was something they did with, with monkeys and it was heartbreaking, it was horrible. But there's a oh, quote about every writer has a chink of ice in their heart and I, my initial experience was that's a terrible thing. But what would happen if you did that to a human was the next thought and that's where the book was born. Um, and, and, I, and I kind of wrote it without any idea if it would ever become a novel. I, I didn't know if it would work as a novel. Thankfully, it did, and I've been writing ever since. Yeah, right, and then you uh, you started another series uh, with uh, The Bone Keeper, which was a you know, terrific, terrific thriller. Um, do you have plans? I, I suspect you probably do to, to continue with that series. It's, it was intended to be a standalone, um, and it's, it's very much... Uh, close to what I grew up reading, like Stuart, I read Stephen King yeah. extensively in my teenage years, um, and I still do. He is probably my favorite writer of all time. But I, I, the Bone Keeper is kind of of me placing a Stephen King story in in Liverpool uh, of all places. It's like it's not it's not like Maine. It's it's a very different place, um, and it's very much about myth and things like that. It's very much closer to what I love to, to read. Um, and the character, the main character in that is uh, Louise, is, is, is one of my favorite characters I've ever created. And I would love to go back to that, but at the moment, I, I'm, I'm enjoying writing standalone. So The Bone Keeper is a standalone, The Silence is a standalone, and my next novel will be a standalone again. But I kind of like the idea of always having those characters that I can go back to at any point and not having the pressure of having to do one book a year with the same characters every time and worrying about whether or not I can go back to that well and still tell a great story through those characters. Right. Um, so I have numerous ideas to go back to, to, to Louise and, and the Bone Keeper will. Um, but, and, and at some point I'm sure I will. You know, it's funny, uh, I get, this is for, I guess for both of you guys, but um, I'm a big fan of George Pelicanos. I'm sure you guys probably are too. One of the things I really admire about him is that uh, his his characters from all the different kind of groupings of books that he's written all seem to have it, inhabit the same world. And so therefore they kind of have little cameos and walkthroughs. I think that's kind of a neat idea. Do you do you view your you know the various characters in your in your books as inhabiting you know one basic place you're just kind of illuminating a, a small part of it? I mean, I, I've always done that. I think in the um, all the Belfast set books, yeah. um, from the from Jerry Fagan through to the Lennon books through to the Flanagan books, they're all the same world um, with different characters moving through them, and sometimes one character moving into the foreground, another character moving into the background, that kind of thing. Um, for me, for me, it's about James Elroy kind of thing. Um, yeah. The way Dudley Smith will keep sort of appearing at times through his books and so on. Um, um, and it kind of gives you the, the continuity, continuity of a series without kind of tying you down quite the same way. And I, I, I very strongly admire writers, likely child like John Connolly, who can come back to the same character over and over again and still unearth something new about them. Um, and I think that's a very particular skill and um, not one that I'm blessed with that, to be honest. I, I, I don't find I can stay with the character that long before I need to kind of move on to somebody else to uh find something else to say about them um uh so keeping that kind of persistent world with different characters moving through it helps that um causes problems when it comes to film rights that's a whole other discussion <laughs> but um it's uh that's that's always been my, my view on it the even books that are uh, theoretically outside of that world like rat lines in my head the albert ryan of rat lines in dublin in 1963 that's still the same ireland that jerry fagan will exist in mm. years later Right. Um, and you know, I, I started writing a new book at the minute. Uh, I'm not, it's uh, in that first few pages, in that first dipping the toes in water. Am I going to finish this book or what, am I not? Kind of stage. Uh, but it's set in Northern Ireland in 1945, and I'm contemplating bringing in a character from the original 
uh, Ghost of Belfast books into that mm. to be a very young child in this book. Um, so things like that, and I, I think readers like that as well. I think they like those little Easter eggs, little, uh, little cookie trails that, um, right. that an author can leave them. Um, but again, you do have to be careful because there's there is a, there's always a consideration of film rights can be tricky with that. Um, but yeah, um, it's always it's always the same world as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I, 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 I don't skew up a little bit from it in, that, in the sense that like the Bone Keeper, I don't think. It, it was always a story I wanted to tell from very early on, but I never felt that it was right for the Murphy and Rossi characters to, to tell that story, um, because it is very much more, you know, you are as a reader questioning what is real and what isn't in the story. With the Murphy and Rossi books, you kind of know that they're very much set in a, in a world that mirrors our own. So I, I, it, it's difficult to think that, like, you know, a Murphy or Rossi would appear in The Bone Keeper because... You know that that instantly the reader would go well. Everything is, is as we thought it was, um, but I do feel like the the the, the setting is what is kind of carries I've carried through through each of my books is that I've consistently shown that my part of the world has been different than what I think a lot of people, especially in the UK, view it as, um, and that's been much more a consideration and have many readers from across. The UK, you have, you have said, you know, that's not how I thought Liverpool looked, and they've thought, you know, or, or felt like, and um, because they saw, you know, a soap 30 years ago, you know, and they've kind of decided that's what Liverpool always looked like. And um, so it's it's much more about the set for me, is that that is the, the same setting that across all books, is that the characters are very much of that setting as well. Um, but I'm writing a book now, which is not set in Liverpool whatsoever, it's set. In the southwest of England and the northwest of, of the US, oh, really? uh, and that's been that's been very much uh, it's been it's been difficult. Um, and at first, I was just going to make up place names and stuff like that because certain scenes and places that I didn't wasn't immediately familiar with was was felt really difficult to do. But I took four days and went to Connecticut in March just before everything went downhill and. Um, <laughs> It, I, I kind of, I kind of feel like you know, I've, you know, I've, I've grown to that place where I can do that kind of thing. There may be characters from previous books who turn up in books moving forward, but they will be like Easter eggs. They will be like if you don't know any of the books beforehand, you wouldn't, you wouldn't need to know. Right. Um, but there'll be those readers who have read all of them. They'll go, oh, that's, that's inter- you know, that's a nice little thing for them. If you know what I mean. Right. Exactly. Well, you know, I mentioned at the beginning you're both musicians and. Um, uh, yeah, Stuart, I wanted to ask you a little bit about, there, there are a couple of stories uh, in, in your new collection that are, you know, music plays a role in. There's a story that's based, uh, a couple of stories based on songs. And, uh, and then you also have this wonderful little short story uh, or short flash fiction about a particular guitar. You know, and as a, as a guitar nerd myself, you know, I, I really got a kick out of reading that about the 57 Black Les Paul. Um, I don't know, can you talk a little bit about, you know, uh, just the influence, I guess, of story songs in general? Um, and, you know, so many of them are just, you know, you think about Springsteen, of course, as the master at that, or, you know, somebody like Dave Alvin or, uh, you know, whoever, Leonard Cohen, whoever you want to talk about who's a master of writing story songs, Towns Van Zant, people like that, um, that create these whole little worlds in their songs. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, it, it's um, it it was my when when I was a teenager, I had my kind of life mapped out for myself. But it was going to be I was going to be a rock star. Um, once I did, but then I wanted to be a writer first. It was the first ambition I ever had was to be a writer when I was a kid. Then I discovered the guitar and decided that being a rock star would be much more fun. Um, so I decided that's what I was going to be. On my life's plans, I was going to be a rock star. And then by the time I was 35, it would be far too old for that anymore. So I'd become a writer then instead. So I kind of got there to the writer part. I just missed the, unfortunately, the rock star part. But um, music has, has, has stuck with me throughout. And uh, uh, I worked in music store for a few years. I taught guitar. I've written music for film and so on. And I think, I, I think it's not a coincidence that so many writers happen to be musicians as well 
um, like, like a disproportionate number. Um, and we could have filled the ranks of the Fun Loving Prime Riders maybe five, ten times over with the people who we know who play instruments. Um, almost all of them are guitar players. That's the only downside of that. But, um, the, uh, um, but when you think of the number of, of, of writers who happen to have a musical side as well, I think it's, it's, it's uh, uncanny that so many do. And I think there must be some, something about the way the brain is wired of writers and musicians. There must be some kind of crossover there, I think. Um, having said that, I, I haven't found music's crept into my writing that often. Um, I mean, I haven't, I've never done what, say, what our, our friend Mark Bullingham does and, and given my character a specific taste in music to explore. And, um, Adrian McKinty, for example, his Sean Duffy character is talking about his record collection quite often and the, the Rankins and Revis is obviously sure. music forms a part of that. I've, I've never gone down that route. Uh, for whatever reason, um, but now again it does pop up. Like you mentioned, the story in uh, the Traveller is called Black Beauty, which anybody who knows guitars will know that's a particular Gibson model, uh, Gibson, a nickname for Gibson as well in the late 50s. Um, and that story came out, that's an odd little story. That came about because there's a UK men's magazine called Shortlist, that's a lifestyle magazine, and it was their 300th edition. And um, they got a bunch of uh, writers to write a 300 word story, and it had to be exactly 300 words long. It had to be about uh, the color black hmm. in some way, more in some way. So, black, black beauty, 300 words. There you go, that's that story. Um, but music music was always there in the background for me, and it kind of came full circle then a few years ago when me and a bunch of other reprobates formed the Fun Loving Crime Writers, and uh, uh, that kind of really took over uh, over the last couple of years. Uh, you agree, look, it kind of became the focal point of our lives. We seem to be playing every other weekend. We were flying up to play somewhere. Um, but obviously, obviously it all came screeching to a halt in March this year. Um, and I think Luca, Luca, I can speak for Luca here, we're both desperately missing that. I bet. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's been, it's been real wrench to, to, to leave that behind over these last few months. Now, have you done any rec have you done any recording at all or just just live live stuff just live stuff i mean we um we decided very early on that we weren't ever going to try and write original material oh, okay. it was always going to be cover versions uh, to, to explain for people who aren't familiar the, the the premise of the band is we're all crime writers and all the songs we play are crime related um so we play uh, uh like i fought the law and Watching the detectives, so we do that, that great old, um, I've forgotten the original artist's name, a song called Psycho, and Psycho Killer, right, Talking Heads as well. Right. On, and you, but you get the theme there. I do, yeah. And, um, and it, it kind of took on a life of its own. Uh, we, we thought it would just do a couple of gigs for a bit of fun, but it became actually quite a serious enterprise. Um, which we came to head last year playing Glastonbury. Um, Glastonbury? Yeah, we played Glastonbury last summer. Oh. Um, you know what you hadn't heard? No, <laughs> if you tell them about this. That must have been a It's the first thing you said in front of anybody that we've talked to you about. Um, That's yeah, cool. we played the Christmas stage at Glastonbury last year. And, um, wow. And you weren't in the tent, right? Uh, you were up on the main stage. No, we weren't on the acoustic stage. It was the. Um, about 5,000 people have watched us. We were quite pleased. That's awesome. Um, That's so cool. The, and. Um, but yeah, it's 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 uh, become such a big part of our lives, and then um, I've lost that again. I'm sorry, I've lost the original thread of your question there. Um, <laughs> sorry, I, think, I, I, I'm sorry. I mean, I, I think I I I probably started off with the same kind of, of uh, view of my life as, as Stuart, but a little bit more sporty. I want my dad was is is a, was a musician when I was growing up, and. Um, and he was always, you know, the, the big thing that we used to bond over was, was music. And um, so I spent a lot of time listening to, to, to records he would buy at the, the, the local car boot fair and stuff like that. And, you know, and that's how I kind of started to love music. But when I started getting a little bit older, when I was getting to 10, 11, that's when I wanted to become a, a football, a soccer player, I should say, because we're in America. <laughs> but I wanted to play soccer and, I, and then it became boxing. I wanted to be a boxer. And I kind of failed at both of those things. And then I wanted to be an actor, I failed at that as well. I did a lot of background work where you would see me just walking in the distance type of thing in the background of numerous television shows. Um, and I did some stage work. And then I 
kind of went around bars a lot. I was in various bands, and I thought I was really going to make it. And those are the kind of professions that in Liverpool you were most likely wanting to be, because all you remember would be Liverpool Football Club or the Beatles or numerous Scouts boxes of good name, um, and that's who you would look up to. Um, and that would be your way out, in a sense of like you know living on on council estate. Uh, and when all of those kind of failed, um, it took a few years of me working a dead end job, and then I became a writer. And I thought that kind of part of my life was over. Um, so I feel I think that is why the fun loving crime writers kind of has taken over is that because it was it was all part of our past, and we never thought we'd be able to go back to it, yeah. um, and we'd never experience that again. We appreciate it a lot more now, and it becomes a lot more fun when you're doing it. And there's no ego about it because we're not trying to become rock stars. We're trying to have a good time, and in turn, the audience will have a good time. So that's why we're not going to write our own stuff because five seconds in, we'd have all beaten each other senselessly because we don't like a certain phrasing with the first line of a song. Right, right, <laughs> yeah, right, right. We're all writers. The egos would come um, in and kill it, right? Exactly. Um, yeah. But I, I, I do agree with Shields. I think there is something to be said about the fact that there is a disproportionate amount of uh, musicians who became writers, and, and you know, there's a lot of uh, people who, who would have been in the band if it wasn't for the case that we had stages of a certain size. You know, is that we could only have six people on the stage, otherwise it would be the most you know numerous band you've ever seen in your life. Now, do, do you all? But at least some... I was just going to say, do you all? I'm, I'm sure you all bring different influences to the table, and that will kind of uh, that will kind of dictate the set list. Uh, I, I was watching some of your stuff, and I was really impressed. You know, and you've got there are a couple of country kind of flavored tunes. Um, you know, some of the classic sort of punk and post punk of of our generation. You know, and then just classic rock stuff as well. Yeah. Uh, I think I think there's a the, the the running joke in the band is that I am I think about ten years younger than the next um, next age person in the band. So most of the songs that we play, I mean almost all of the songs we play were released before I was born. Um, so there's a running joke in the band that like you know it would be nice if we did one that I knew. Um, but there's a number of songs in the set that I kind of did grow up with, so we didn't have to play them. I'm not saying this just to point out the fact that some members of the band are around the same age as my father, but it's <laughs> it, it's it's songs that I knew quite well. But even then, when they come with when we come up with new songs and things like that, and I try and sneak in one that may have been released in the last twenty years, it's very much a democracy of like, well, if this will get people up and dancing and having a good time, then it goes in, and as long as it's something to do with crime, then it goes in. If it's a good song, it'll go in. Um, and we've kind of always just kind of based it around that is that there is no kind of feeling of like I want I want to kind of shove my own likes of songs into the set and, and we'll all play to what I like and that's everything. Everyone has an influence and I think that's why you do have those kind of different genres yeah. of songs. Yeah. Of course the nerd in me and don't worry folks we'll get back to talking about books but uh the, the nerd in me wants to kind of recycle it. Okay, so what are some good crime related? And I think, you know, somebody got murdered by the clash would be a good one. Um, oh gosh, homicide by 999. And there's so many, so many interesting options. Uh, you know, it's funny, uh, Stuart, I was going to ask you, um, you know, it was Ian, Ian Rankin, who's, you know, I'm sure we all know is a big music nerd and, um, he, he kind of got me aware of and turned on to Rory Gallagher, you know, mm -hmm. uh, who, of course, is the big guitar hero of, of Ireland um, and not quite as well known uh, here in the States. But the people that do know of him really love him. Uh, was he was he present when you were around or, or had he already passed away when you were a kid and growing up? Yeah. Um... He was very much around now. He, he, I guess he was, uh, his heyday was really the 70s. Yeah. Um, and one of his best known albums is Irish Tour, the live album yeah, from recording the 70s, a lot of that classic stuff. He was in the 70s. He was still around in the 80s, but I, th I think his health is, was kind of. Right. 
Uh, failing at that point, but I mean, he was still, I mean, he was huge throughout Europe and like Germany and so on. And uh, um, uh, there's a huge online, if just Google Rory Gallagher and on or, or look on YouTube, there's a wealth of stuff online of live performances. He was one of those musicians who was just on the road constantly. Um, so yeah, he was very much there, and Gary Moore as well. Um, uh, he was probably more commercially successful uh, than Rory Gallagher, but you know, of, of a similar vintage and very similar, not well, not necessarily similar styles, but very much in that blues. He was in Thin Lizzy for a minute, wasn't he? He was in Thin Lizzy, he was in various bands and then, but he, he, he kind of had a, I guess, a hair metal period in the 80s where right. he did quite well, and then kind of this huge that. comeback in the 90s playing uh, um, more straight blues. Um, he was a Belfast guy, whereas Rory was uh, from Cork. Um, See, Gary was yeah, too. The, 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 those, Gary was sorry? too. Gary was too ugly for the uh, for the hair metal scene, and so that didn't really work for him. <laughs> that didn't I mean, really he probably still right though. He did okay. He had some heads in it, but um, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's that's not the only kind of. But yeah, he. Uh, he but they were, they were very much that sort of generation that followed after uh, Clapton and Beck and Peter Green and so on and. Um, but even today, I mean, uh, 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 Rory Gallagher's legacy is still very much um, alive today. Particularly in Ireland, where he's very revered and uh, much Europe as well. Right. Well, to get back to the books, which um, uh, Jack Jack Lennon makes his return in this uh, in the title novella of this story, and um, you know, for a lot of us, myself included, I was always kind of wondering, all right, what, where, where did he go off to? And all those questions are answered here. Um, without giving away too many spoilers, can you talk a little bit about The Traveler? Yeah, it's, it's as I say in the intro to the book, I, I, in the intro to the collection, I give a little, a little paragraph to each story to explain how it came about. And The Traveler itself, uh, the novella, um, was partly my own desire to see what happened to Lennon, but also from all the emails I kept getting, and I just kept getting people asking me what happened to Lennon, what happened to Alan, what happened to the Traveller, what happened to Dan, you know, all these different characters that appeared in the earlier books. And um, and I had not I had this idea in mind, I'd always had a good idea of where Lennon wound up, which was working as a security guard, uh, as a very broken man, uh, seaside town on the north coast of, of uh, Antrim in Ireland. And, um, and kind of knew where Alan was a teenager, I knew where the traveller was, kind of in my head an idea of where all these characters were in the world. And I knew how they would come together, but I never had a reason to actually sit down and write it. Um, because I mean, a novella as a commercial enterprise is fairly, fairly much a dead end, because you know, a publisher isn't going to want to try to sell a novella in itself. But when then, I, when I raised the idea of doing the collection um, last year with Soho Press, um, that opened the door then, that gave me a good reason to actually sit down and write this, and it was nice, it was nice to revisit those characters, and, um, and it was a fairly easy thing to write, simply because everything was kind of already in place, so all I had really had to do was set these different characters on a collision course, and the plot kind of took, took care of itself then. Um, yeah, so it was nice to revisit them, nice to see where people were, it was nice to tie up those loose ends. Um, nice is possibly the wrong word. For this novel. <laughs> um, but it's yeah it was good it was good I enjoyed it I enjoyed getting back to those characters I enjoyed sort of uh, finishing off some of those stories that had never really been quite finished properly and, and, and giving us um, some people their fair dues if that makes sense and then there are there are a few stories you know I talked a little bit about the you know kind of the myth mythological folkloric aspect um, and there are several stories in the book, like I'm thinking of the Green Lady, and uh, mm -hmm. particularly of Echo, that kind of play off those those elements. And I was very interested uh, when when you I think I've heard you talk about this before, but um, you know you had that that one kind of shit year when you had writer's block, and yeah. it was really bothering you. And um, and I think I read somewhere that Echo kind of lured you out of that period. Is that correct to say? That's what I, it helps her tag me over. Uh, it, it was that was a strange one because I actually got I woke up in the middle of the night 
Actually, I think I, think I got some insomnia, and I hadn't been able to write for about six months or so at that stage. And I was really kind of tearing my hair out. When I say not, I hadn't been able to write. I'd written loads, but not anything that was actually usable or publishable. But I woke up in the middle of the night there with this, purely this idea of a young boy who's being raised as a reincarnation of his own sister, who died before he was born. Um, and I sat down with no particular sort of plan in mind, just started writing about this 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 kid. But I didn't know what it was. I didn't know if it was a novel or a short story or a novella or what what it was going to be. And um, I kept working on it over a number of months and coming back and adding a couple of thousand words. So I had about fifteen thousand words or so of this story. Um, that didn't quite have a direction, but at different points of view, at the at a some chapters that were journal entries from the father, this kind of thing was turning into a much, much kind of sprawling thing. And I could just never figure out what it was, what to do with it. And then I got a message from a, 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 a Belfast writer called Lucy Caldwell, um, asking for uh, submissions for a short story collection uh, for Favour in the UK of Irish short fiction. And I was getting a deadline, I kept feeding up the deadline and I didn't have anything for her. And I kept thinking, well, I'm going right here. And eventually, um, it was like two days before the deadline, I remembered Echo, that story, and I went back and looked at it, and I, over the course of a weekend, I pared it down from 15,000 words to about 6,000 words. And I realized, actually, that was what it was supposed to be all along, was this short story, a very compact one. Um, and it's the thing I, I, I had to come to terms with, sometimes when you, when you, sometimes when you start to write something, it takes a figure out. It takes a while to figure out what exactly it is. Um, and for example, the novel uh, that will be coming out from Soho next year um, is another example of that. That's a story that been, it took me a long, long time to get nailed down because I just couldn't figure out what it was. Um, and it happens sometimes. You know, it's I, I, again, I admire those writers who are able to sort of do that uh, sort of book a year kind of cycle and, and always have this sort of a. a, a Always have a path forward, and I've always struggled with that, um, of 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 maintaining a, a sort of a straight line as a writer. I was constantly kind of veering off in different directions, and um, and very often stumbling when I do so, and getting lost when I do so. And um, yeah, so I think that's 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 that, I think that's going to be a feature of my writing as we go on. Is there always going to be these kind of odd left turns, um, which you might find the next novel will be as well. The next novel, as you said, was the the novel set in nineteen forty five, right? Well, no, that's that's the one I'm writing. I just started writing the one oh. the, the one that's coming next year. I'm actually in the editing process of now. I'm desperately trying to come up with the title for. It. I'm tearing my hair out. I actually see any hair I've lost at the minute. That's purely over the last few days from tearing my hair out trying to think of a novel for this book. I think of a title for this book. Sorry. Um, What's your working title? It was Children of the Ashes. But then the book went through so many changes that that title didn't quite fit anymore, um, and I'm I'm stumped now. I'm, 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 I might be one to just throw back to the editors and tell them to come up with something because I'm stuck. <laughs> Can you tell us anything about this book? This book, actually, I haven't actually talked about this publicly at all. I think this will be the first time I've talked about it. It's um, the premise on a woman called Sarah who has just moved into this house, she's English, but she's moved in with her Irish husband into this house into a remote area of Northern Ireland. It's a very old house that they're renovating and building extensions on and so on. She's been there a few days. And uh, as the book opens, she's trying to clean this red stain that keeps appearing on the old stone kitchen floor. She can't get the stain to go. Uh, every time she cleans, it comes back. Um, but we're at 6 a.m. one morning, there's a banging at the front door this frantic bang on the door and she goes to the door and there's an elderly woman there asking her, what are you doing in my house why are you in my house and uh her husband comes down and takes the old lady away to the uh, care home that he knows she's resident in so sarah starts to look into who owned this house beforehand and she discovers that around 60 years ago uh there was a family family annihilation in this house uh Three men and two women were killed. And Mary, this woman, my dog has just entered the room. Sorry. Hi, <laughs> <laughs> sweetie, how are you doing? <laughs> oh, he's away. Um, 
at uh, uh, just a dramatic moment too. She, uh, uh, Mary, uh, at the age of 12, was the sole survivor of this massacre. And a large part of the book is told from Mary's point of view uh, from that time. And it's unusual, this book, and it's written, I've never done this before, it's written in sort of Northern Irish vernacular, um, sort of Ulster, Ulster Scots dialect. I hope it's still readable for, for other readers not from here. But um, it was kind of an experimental thing and kind of reaction against the previous two novels I've written have been more kind of um, consciously commercial, the two Heel and Back books. And this book, I really wanted to kind of dig in a bit more and go the opposite direction. So, so it's a book, it's not maybe as immediately commercial as some other books I've written, but I'm pleased with how it's turned out. And this um, writing with an accent is something I've never ever done before. Um, I, I think it's worked, I hope it's worked, and it's, you know, it's split between different timelines. Uh, a large part of the book is set around 1960, a large part of the book is set around the present day, and how these different stories interweave, and, um, and about uh, abuse and coercion and all that good stuff. Wow, that sounds fantastic. Yeah. We just got it. I can't remember who it was. Um, oh boy. Close my door here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> got in, into an interesting conversation with um, authors. I, gosh, I'm sorry, I can't remember who it was, but uh, it was about how, you know, vi you know, places in which violence has occurred, you know, be it mm -hmm. be it buildings, or sometimes it's like whole towns. Uh, you know, it, very interesting to to is is the residue from that still there, and can you feel it? For instance, I mean, for myself, there's a, there are a couple of towns in southeastern Arizona where one of them is called Bisbee, which is a great, really cool little mining town. But there was a tremendous amount of labor violence. And, you know, it's very close to the Apache, Apache country and the Apache Wars. I always get kind of a weird vibe when I go there, you know. And uh, I like uh, Joe Lansdale, I think, was the one I was talking with. And he wrote a whole really interesting book called Lost Echoes, which dealt with that question, you know, about the, how, vi you know, the imprint of violence uh, in, in buildings, and specifically in that case. But it sounds uh, wonderful. It's very, that's very much a theme in this book about um, how uh, uh, it's kind of seeped into the soil, you know, the, the, the violence that's happened here and that um, the house the people, the, the, this annihilation, family annihilation that happened in this house was a, it was a culmination of years of abuse. And, um, and, and Mary, the, the older one, as it asked this question, was it in the ground before the house was built? You know, was this, were the seeds of it there, you know? Right. Um, so yeah, that's very much the theme in this book. And I think that's something that, uh, again, it's something Stephen King has talked about quite a lot, I think, and um, it's a kind of a quite common theme in horror. Right. as well and you know, think down a little hard and stuff like that as well. sure right now luca it's funny uh, we got i got sidetracked a little bit but i'm coming back to uh to the silence and i really wanted to talk to you about that book and um a few minutes ago you were talking about you know 90s music and um and that really is is a nice segue into talking about about the silence um which has a really terrific kind of setup uh, and i don't want to give away any spoilers but I mean, from the very beginning, we know what the basic premise is. Uh, would you mind kind of going over that briefly, and we can talk about it? Yeah. So what I noticed was that um, the, there was a, there was seemed to be a, 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 a big thing to go back to the nine, to the eighties recently. So we had like sitcoms like the Goldbergs, and there was a Stranger Things is very much you know set in the eighties. But for me, the nineties was was my decade, so I couldn't go back to the eighties. So um, I, I, I wanted to do something that was kind of had that '90s vibe, and what I, what I thought about was um, if people have been friends since they, they were up that age when they were in school together. Now I I've got a couple of friends from school, but not many. But I know a number of other people who have been friends for going on thirty years, and I've always kind of wondered about that dynamic. Um, and I've also noticed that a lot of people, not myself, but a lot of people I knew were waiting until their 30s until they started families and started getting married and having children. 
<clears throat> so I, 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 I kind of thought about this and I thought about a group of six friends um, based on the fact that Friends, the TV series from the 90s, had six people in it and there were three women and three men. Um, and how close they were. And what if, you know, this group of friends, something, the, the worst thing that you could ever do together happens one night at a 90s themed music festival, which is supposed to kind of bookend the, the, the end of their youth of all, of all of, of things. So, like, they've kind of grown up, they've done the thing, they've been, they've been in relationships and they've gone on holidays and they've worked and they've kind of bought houses and, and all that kind of thing. And now they're going to settle down and, and do the, the, the adult kind of thing of, you know, settle down, get married, and have children. So, this music festival is kind of a way of, of bookending that, that youth, if you, if you know what I mean. The last what year, happens? Uh... What, what, what if, if the worst thing happens, how would that group of friends kind of react if they are so close together? You know, what would, what would they do afterwards? Um, and how would that group splinter? How would they deal with the after effects of a terrible, terrible thing that happened? And, uh, well, can, you, I, can we say what happened or is that, would that be a spoiler? That might I, be a spoiler. I, I, I think it. I think it happened so early on in the book, yeah. and, and, and it's 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 difficult because I think everyone kind of knows what 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 I would be talking about in a crime novel is that there is a murder that happens, of course, in the dead of in, in the woods, and it's about how these friends react to what happens and how they blame themselves and each other for for what happened, um, and it's about the fact that a, a year passes in the book, and it's about what we see as the after effects of that. But what if someone saw what they did? What if someone knows what they did? And what if people start dying around them in a sort of 90s slasher film type right. of way? Right. No, it's just a blast. Really enjoyed it. But there's also, you know, it's funny. It's it's that, that rare combination of, uh, you know, super page turner setup, you know, with sort of this propulsive plot. But also there's a lot of real moving kind of poignant uh, aspects of, of you know character development that I think a lot of people you know my generation would have been the 80s probably like Stewart's was uh, but it, you know that we can relate to you know that that period of transition uh, mm. and I think that's something that kind of has come to me a little bit later is the idea that character the character is king and uh, it's something that our, our mutual friend Mark Billingham has kind of drummed into me from a very uh, early points in my career is that characterization is so so important and it wasn't until really I was writing the standalones that I felt the freedom to explore that so I got the freedom to kind of explore things that I was feeling because these were ordinary people they weren't cops they weren't you know the people attached to the police these were ordinary people having extraordinary things happen to them right and, and it kind of allowed me to to kind of delve into the psychology of what Put, put myself in that position, put my, my loved ones in that position and, and my friends and things like that and saying, well, what would they do? How would they react? How would I react? How would that? And that kind of kind of drew me into that. And the silence is very much the main character in that book is very much based on me. The, the, the main character of that book has a real issue with silence and that's something that I have a real issue with. And I, <clears throat> I, I now carry around headphones and I'll have something playing in my ears all the time. Um, if I'm just walking around the house or if I'm doing the dishes or I'm cleaning up or any time I'm doing anything, I can't handle silence. Um, so that's something I put into the character and just made it a little bit darker about the reason why. For me, I just have a, I struggle with boredom. I can't be bored. I, I will end up getting into trouble. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm bored. laughs> so I need to have like a podcast playing or music playing or youtube videos or you know a, a audio book or anything i need that constant kind of interaction to the point where i can't go to sleep without noise and um, but putting that into the character in the silence allowed me to kind of explore a darker reason for why someone might not like silence at all so it's not likely that you're, you'll be joining a monastery anytime soon is what you're saying not not really i mean the silence it would be part of it but there are many reasons why i wouldn't be joining the monastery <laughs> Well, Stuart, um, you also you had um, wasn't there some sort of sleep? Uh, forgive me if I'm misremembering. Wasn't there a sleep condition that you had that plays into one of your stories? 
Yeah, sleep paralysis. Yeah. Um, I uh, I have this thing, and, and um, there's what what happened. There's one of the stories we had in in this collection um, when I was talking to it with Juliet, my editor. So we decided to take pull it out of the collection. We didn't think it sat that well with the rest of the story. So um, and he didn't know the story. Um, that's the problem. And somebody says, write, write a story. That's when you, it's becomes quite difficult to actually do it. You can't sort of pull something out of thin air. But I, uh, in the weeks leading up to it, I have been suffering an unusual amount of sleep paralysis. It's become almost a weekly thing. Um, I, should, I should explain what that is for people who don't know. It's um, what is colloquially called the night hag, which is the title of the story. Right. And the basics of it is, as you wake up, you're lying in bed but you can't move and you're dreaming while you're awake and um, it, what happens is this, the, the, the yeah, what actually happens is your brain releases the hormone that actually stops you thrashing about when you're dreaming when you're asleep what happens is something overlaps with you waking so you actually wake up but you're basically paralyzed um, and you're still dreaming and what happens then is kind of a hallucination and for most people it's being it's some sort of creature sitting on top of them, usually a woman for some reason. I don't know why this is, but there'll, there'll usually be an old woman sitting on top of them, sitting, maybe sitting on their chest, maybe holding them down. And in the moment when it's happening to you, it's absolutely 100% completely real. There's nothing, there's no consciousness with being a dream, being anything unreal. As far as you're aware, you're awake and somebody is pinning you down on the bed. And for me personally, I can never see them. It's always somebody that's wrapped their arms and legs around me that's holding me down. And at its worst, I start start whispering in my ear, and and it's in my head. As far as I'm concerned, when this is ongoing, this is absolutely completely real. There's no hallucination about this whatsoever, and it's bloody terrifying. I mean, it's really, really, really terrifying when it happens. And um, so I thought I could do maybe do a story based on this, seeing as it's been happening to me frequently lately. And um, yeah, that's the story of the night hag. And in the story, it becomes a manifestation of the protagonist's guilt um, about something that's happened. But I actually really enjoyed the character. She's quite a, a fussy kind of a older lady who, who lives alone and, and regards three cups of tea as excessive. Um, you know, and she's, she's uh, to, to kind of push her to the edge of a breakdown with sleep paralysis was quite fun. Maybe that's cruel of me. <laughs> Sharing the suffering, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I uh, I've only done this twice, but I'm you know, my wife says I'm like possessed in my in my sleep. You know, I I'll hold mm. forth, you know, and lecture at full top volume. Um, and twice I've thrown myself out of the bed, and we have wooden floors, and it's quite painful. And I did it the other night, and it. Damn, uh -huh. it's crazy. Uh, um, I'm just looking to see if we have maybe, any... Maybe yours is the night wrestler on the night hike. That's right. <laughs> I'm just checking to see if we have any questions from our Facebook audience. And um, Okay, uh, a gentleman named Barry asks, uh, Stuart, when will we get a sequel to Rat Lines? Which you kind of partially answered that. Oh, I've been threatening to write one for years. And... Um, I have this ongoing problem. I have books that I've been meaning to write, and there's a top a couple of them, two of them, um, and I and I always have very good intentions. The next book I write will be that book, and one of those is the sequel to Rat Lines. I know what it's about. It's it's quite a big sprawling book, um, set in the late sixties, um, bringing Charles Hay back again as a character, Albert Ryan, and so on. Um, bringing in other real historical figures from Northern Ireland as well as the Republic of Ireland, and I, it's uh, the, the it's the openings we kind of mapped out in my head, but I just can't seem to get around to actually committing to writing it. Partly because it's going to take a huge amount of research. Um, I think I need to allow myself a couple of years maybe to to research and write it, um, because it'd be so tied into real historical events. Um, so I do intend to write it at some point, but um, it'll be when I have maybe a bit of breathing space and I have that extra time to do the research for it. Um, having said that, instead of writing the book, I intend to write, I've now started writing this thing set in 1945, 
which was a good take a look at research as well, but you know, not, nothing is not a masochist. <laughs> so it would be the great, the great Northern Irish uh, uh, Cold War novel, right? Kind of. It would be bringing in all sorts of people who there were a lot of interest. That period of uh, between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland uh, from the mid sixties to the mid seventies, there were a lot of interesting people about. Some really bad actors. Some. A lot of agendas at work, a lot of bad decisions, um, and it's a really far out period. And it's something I really want to write about. And to have Albert Ryan, who is essentially a, a, a part of the Irish Secret Service, um, in the midst of all that, I find really interesting. But it's just it's again, it's just the commitment of time to research and so on to get it done. And if I do, I want to do it right. Um, so it will be written someday, someday, maybe not in the next couple of books, but it's it's in the pipeline somewhere. Now, just just for my own edification, uh, any more Serena Flanagan? I really love that character. I'm sure a lot of people do. I, I honestly don't know. I honestly don't know. Um, it may be the case that in a few years she'll get a she'll get a kind of a a wrapping up story the way the way Jack Lannan has had. What actually happened was the book that's being published this time next year by Soho, uh, the, one, the one I can't think of a title for, um, it said across two timelines, as I was saying, the story of Mary in this house years ago, and um, there's a version of that book that exists, which is the present day, is a Serena Flanagan story. And uh, for many and various reasons, I decided it wasn't a strong enough story, and I pulled that out and re re rewritten completely from scratch, a different present day story for that. That may well not the story that I pulled out from present day Serena Flanagan may end up being reworked into something for her or the novella or a novel I don't know. The short answer is there's no immediate plans, but I'm sure she'll you'll, you'll see something over somewhere down the line. Gotcha. Um, well, Luca, can you tell us a little bit? You said your next book uh, is also a standalone. Is there anything you could <laughs> share with us about that? Uh, yeah. So it's um, it's. It's about a, a guy who's, uh, in, who's from a small town in, in England who was believed for 25 years that his mother died when he was young. Um, he has a very fractious relationship with his dad growing up after this terrible thing happens. Um, and he moves away to, to the capital. And 20 years later, he gets a phone call to say his dad's in hospital. And when he gets back there, his dad says his last words to him, which is, your mother's still alive. And this kind of leads to him going off trying to find out if this is true and if so, what happened and why, um, which leads him to crossing the Atlantic. And the vast majority of the book takes place in the northeast of America in a small town called Mystic in Connecticut. All right. Sounds great. Um, I'm looking forward to, to actually share with people because so far I've been living with this book for about 15 months and about three people have read it and that was like my editor and agent and me. So it's, <laughs> I'm looking forward to getting after it. Well, that's cool. Do you, do you find that with the, with the standalones, um, you're kind of liberated from the, the pressure of having to research all that, you know, nitty gritty police procedural detail? I mean, it's been very much a kind of a, a burden lifting, not writing police characters. Because you are constantly reminded with every review that comes in that you may not have got a single piece of procedure correct. And that's because as I have a member of my family who was in the police for 25 years, and they explained to me quite simply that 95% of the police in life is very, very boring, and then 5% is just oh, chaos. And it was very, it's very difficult to write those kind of characters where you're trying to reflect real life because otherwise it would just be filling out forms for pages and pages of just like, and then Murphy filled in box 1A and then Murphy filled, you know, it wouldn't work. And I also kind of like the idea of, of ordinary people being thrust into extraordinary situations and then seeing how they kind of react to them. And, and that's what I've enjoyed writing most of all throughout my career. Um, I've kind of concentrated on victims quite a lot in my earlier work, and, and that's what kind of draws me to, to, to being interested in what I'm writing is, is kind of exploring ordinary people's reactions to awful situations. Right. right. And I, I find, um, I very much, you were asking me, Serena Flanagan, and one of the reasons I've not written about her for a few books, I've moved away from her, is because I've kind of lost interest in the police procedural. It's a, it's, um, it's a restrictive form, and um, 
that you're constantly walking a tightrope of kind of trying to make it authentic, if not realistic, but also making it readable as a story as well. Because if you wrote if you wrote a, a, a murder mystery, and the murder got solved in the way it actually does in the real world of real policing, it would be a terrible book. <laughs> a lot of porn film, a lot of minutiae and so on. Um, and it's 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 and oddly enough, it's it's the structure that puts within you having to work within the frameworks of, of how of what the, how the police do things and and um, you're at, at almost every sentence you go to write in terms of investigation you have to think like, well could this actually happen would a police officer actually be allowed to do this this kind of thing right. um, and it's not like and I I, I think with a lot of American writers um, they got the private detective novel to to sort of shift to liberate them from that, allows you still do an investigation, but not having the, 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 the procedural aspect of it. But there's very few writers on this side of the Atlantic that can make a, a private detective novel work because the idea of the private detective on our side of the Atlantic is a very different thing from the sort of the classical American private detective uh, that we that we well, you know. And it's also, I'd say, our mutual friend Steve Kavna, he his investigator is, is, an, is a lawyer rather than a cop, you know, and there are different professions that will allow you to do the investigation and mystery story in an American setting that kind of don't work for us over here. Again, Steve's books are set in the States, um, but a lawyer in London wouldn't be able to do the things that his Eddie Flynn character does, for example. Right. Um, so when you're writing crime in the UK, you're kind of, or Aaron for that matter, you're kind of, the, the, the police, police procedural is kind of kind of swallows everything up. It's, it's kind of the only route if you want to do actual investigative fiction, but it's, again, it becomes a really kind of narrow funnel for your ideas because it is so restrictive, unfortunately. Right. That's, that's, that's definitely something that I've been up Because there are so many amazing police procedural writers in the UK as well, I mean, like, yeah. just from the band that we're in, we have, you know, Mark Billingham and Val McDermott, who... Uh, uh, king and queen of that that genre for me. It's like you know, and then you have Ian Rankin on top of that as well. And it's like you can't that, that they've set the bar so high that it's very different, difficult to kind of bring anything new to that game. And some do say that Hillary does it brilliantly, and the, the numerous other people that do it, as Nugent and, and other people like that. It's just it's very it's very interesting to me. Is that like it, it is that difference between both sides of the Atlantic? Is that I think there's only I think there's only two private detective novels that I kind of know of in the UK. That, that lasted more than a novel, Tim Weaver and Nick Quantrill. And then I can't really think of many others. In, in well, well, Chris Brickmire's uh, Parliament, he's a journalist, Parliament. investigator, yeah. and he's found a way to make that work. Um, and actually, I think some Val's books were journalist characters rather than cops yeah. and the other books. Um, well, they're probably, again, from a, from a practical to retail perspective, because of the shrinking of the book market in the UK in terms of retailers. Right. Um, the crime section is only so big, and only, the shelf that holds the police procedurals is only so big. So unless Luca and I conspire to kill Mark and Val, <laughs> those, those spaces aren't really opening up, you know, until somebody pops their clothes. Um, so yeah, it's it's yeah, it's yeah, for me, stepping outside the police procedural has been a big liberator. Mm. Forget I said that, Mark and Val don't. <laughs> well, I, lo I, yeah. love what, I love what Denise Mina does too. She's kind of a, an interesting yeah. mix of both worlds. Um, yeah. Well, gentlemen, it's been really great talking with you both. Uh, we've kind of gone over a little bit, and uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to, to spend with us today talking, and congratulations on publication of your new books. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us. Thank you. And cheers, everybody, on Facebook. Stop it.